और बिस्मिल्लाम आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिन सेरेमनी ऑफ दी ऑनलाइन सर्टिफिकेट कोर्स on the diagnosis of covid-19 sample collection rna extraction pcr and data interpretation i request kari hafiz mohammad bilal for the recitation of few, few verses of the holy quran on the diagnosis of covid-19 sample collection rna extraction PCR and data interpretation. I request Kari Hafiz Muhammad Bilal for the recitation of few few verses of the Holy Quran. Um, on the diagnosis of COVID-19, sample collection, RNA extraction, PCR and data interpretation. I request Kari Hafiz Muhammad Bilal for the recitation of few few verses of the Holy Quran. On the diagnosis of COVID-19, sample collection, RNA extraction, PCR, and data interpretation. I request Kari Hafiz Muhammad Bilal for the recitation of few few verses of the Holy Quran. As we all know that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 has brought a state of emergency worldwide. Due to this pandemic, which has affected actually the whole whole world and uh, underdeveloped countries. has been very much affected because of the the poor healthcare system so that uh, for this reason comstec uh, has decided to uh, conduct a workshop which is actually based on the practical sessions to see how this test is conducted The current gold standard test for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 is the real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, real-time RT-PCR assay. In this con, um, in this context, Comstec, in collaboration with the International Center for Chemical and Biological Sciences, is organizing. a training course on the diagnostic workflow of the SARS-CoV-2 virus the program includes experimental and discussion sessions on sample collection virus rna extraction and technicalities for accurate diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 real time pcr and data interpretation now we have uh, french translate translation je vous souhaite tous la bienvenue à la cérémonie inaugurale du cours en ligne sur le diagnostic de la covid-19 collecte de données l'extraction de l'ARN PCR et l'interprétation des données comme vous le savez tous la maladie à coronavirus est en train de se répandre au niveau mondial et a causé un syndrome aigu respiratoire au coronavirus D 
SAR, COVD et a reporté un statut de l'émergence à l'échelle mondiale. Le statut actuel pour le test de détection du coronavirus est une transcription, est une polymérase à transcription réverse de la chaîne de réaction test. Dans ce contexte, comme check en collaboration avec le Centre international des sciences chimiques et biologiques, est en train d'organiser une formation, une cour de formation sur le diagnostic de la COVID, de la maladie à COVID-19. Le programme inclut les discussions et la partie pratique sur la collecte des données et sur l'extraction de l'ARN viral et les facilités techniques sur le diagnostic de corona, coronavirus 19, PCR et l'interprétation des données. Thank you so much. Now I would like to request for data journal Constec Excellency Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Chaudhry for the welcome address. Azubillahi minashat wa rajim. Bismillah wa rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, I, I'm just so pleased to see uh, increasing number of participants and I've been told by my uh, colleagues, uh, Ms. Hanifa Baik and Dr. Atiyat al-Wahab that over 400 participants have actually registered for this immensely successful training course. You can imagine that uh, in the world where uh, physical meetings are so difficult now, uh, we are now together for a very important course online. And hopefully soon, as the world will change, we would have the opportunity of being together and learning from each other. You see, uh, never in the history of humanity, uh, humanity has faced problem of this nature. This is a health crisis of unparalleled magnitude, a crisis which has never happened before. Of course, there were many pandemics in the history, but the way this pandemic has spread is unprecedented. Now, if you look into the world, you will find that uh, there were countries which were successful in containing this health crisis, uh, and there were countries who miserably failed to, uh, to control this major health crisis or to meet the challenge which health crisis has faced. And if you look into it, you would really find two patterns. Number one, good governance. You know, you would find that countries with good governance were able to handle the situation much better than the others. Uh, uh, leadership which were caring, leadership which were able to develop good healthcare system, leadership which provided a regimented, coordinated response were able to solve this problem much earlier than the other. And the second important thing is deployment of science. So science has been deployed faster than ever uh, in, during this pandemic because science was used as a main tool of uh, taking care of this huge human crisis. And deployment of science has been unprecedented. You see, from... Uh, from uh, from the day when this pandemic has begun to happen and reports start coming, scientists have started working on this uh, uh, virus. And from genome to development of test kit to understanding the virulence, uh, molecular biology, to understand how it is spread, has been absolutely unprecedented. So never in the history of science, uh, history of humanity, science has been so fastly deployed. And if I tell you, they are literally hundreds of thousands of research papers have already appeared in last eight to 10 months on this pandemic. This is a proof that science has been used. We all understand there's a health crisis, but of course health crisis of this magnitude eventually lead to social crisis and economic crisis. 
So uh, this is very important for us to understand that uh, this health crisis has been subject something in which has really led us to think and, and to think of what the world would look like after pandemic would be over. Perhaps we can think of coming back to normal, but in my opinion, there would be nothing like coming back to normal. It's going to be a next normal, a new normal, because uh, somebody said very rightly, pandemics of this magnitude leave uh, a world a fresh, a new one. And uh, this is a gateway between the old world and the new world. So there would be no coming back to normal. In fact, it's going to be a next normal. And we have to prepare this, prepare ourselves for that. Francis, I can tell you that health will not be uh, a regional or national issue now. It's going to be a global issue. It's going to be global health security issues. Any pandemic, any epidemic, uh, any disease of this unknown nature appears anywhere in the world would be taken as a global problem because if one region of the world is not safe, all of us are not safe also. So the world has to be looking into a fresh, everything has to be looked into the perspective of a global pandemic and global health crisis. Now, COMSTAC, which is an interministerial committee of 57 OIC member states, is actually mandated to look into uh, ways of cooperation between countries, uh, the OIC member states, science and technology cooperation, and to help science and technology innovation and preparedness. Now, science, as we know, is apolitical. It has no religion. It is. Uh, is non-dogmatic, it is universal and it has no boundaries, so it can bring people together. So I see science as a unifying force. It's not uh, only for the OIC member state, in fact, science is for everyone and anything which we do should really help the humanity at large. So it is a unifying force. It is not only for one religion or one region, it is for everyone. And that is the reason why Comstech has initiated lots of, lots of programs. So if you find time, kindly visit Comstech website, comstech.org. Then you find many programs such as scholarships in virology and vaccine development. You'll find Alliance of, uh, of Virology and Vaccine, de vaccine uh, Technology. You would find many opportunities where you would really be able to develop your own capacity and many lectures and events have been organized on virology. So in the next several months, you would be able to benefit from many of these programs. I would uh, invite you to look into those programs and see where you would like to interact and benefit from that because these programs are especially designed to develop capacity. It is extremely important to develop capacity. We have seen in the OIC region and many developing world that literally no tests were conducted because of a very simple fact that uh, the required capacity to conduct high quality tests were non-existent. There are lots of bright people all over and it is just a matter of providing them opportunity of learning. And this is exactly what this uh, uh, workshop offers. This is an online training course and I can see about 284 people already online. And this is uh, uh, an opportunity for you to learn from some of the best people in the field uh, from an institution which is among the best uh, in the developing world. And you would find that uh, your uh, colleagues at National Institute of Virology at International, International Center for chemical and biological sciences uh, would be able to tell you how these tests are conducted. Uh, we all know that the technology is developed to test COVID-19, uh, but of course, so far, this is the gold standard as has been mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Kitu Mahal, that uh, PCR-based test is the gold standard, and this is the test which is most reliable. Uh, despite the fact that it's more reliable, the skill of a person, how to conduct this test is extremely important because there are many pitfalls, there are many issues, there are many problems where your deep understanding of, uh, of, the, of the subject and also your deep understanding of how these tests are performed are extremely important. Otherwise, 
there would be many false negative and false positive. You probably have heard about them also. Uh, Francis Banana and Papaya is showing positive COVID-19 tests is because a simple fact is that, uh, you know, uh, often uh, there is a uh, uh, lack of skills and, and capacity deficit. So I, I, uh, I hope that this uh, training course will provide you an opportunity of learning. Plus, please do interact with your, with your instructors, with your colleagues in Karachi, ask them questions and uh, make sure that everything which is presented is properly understood. You already have a manual with you. Uh, it provides you lots of information. And, uh, and I'm sure that your colleagues uh, uh, who are conducting this workshop would be very pleased to provide you further information. But at the end of the day, I think uh, our common mission need to be that we uh, are now with learning towards a mutual uh, objective of developing capacity in the field of virology is not COVID-19 alone, but once you understand the technology involved, you would be able to perform many viral related uh, PCR based tests for other diseases also. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers, my colleagues uh, in University of Karachi, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rashid, uh, Dr. Sabah, Dr. Hana, uh, Dr. Atiya, my colleague here at Comstack, uh, uh, Ms. Hanifa, and all of you for your active uh, cooperation, your active participation, and for the preparation of my colleagues who have actually done a lot of work to make this uh, workshop a successful one. I hope this would benefit everyone and this would benefit humanity at large. Thank you very much on behalf of Comstack. Welcome to this workshop. And I hope that uh, in future also we'll get opportunities of learning together. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would like to request uh, my colleague, Dr. Kasali for the French translation of uh, of the welcome address. Uh, uh, le professor, uh, uh, professor uh, Mohamed Iqbal Choubri, uh, director uh, de l'ICCBS, uh, vient de s'adresser uh, en ces termes. Donc, il évoque les problèmes de coronavirus, que c'est un problème à l'échelle mondiale. La rapidité et l'expansion de la maladie, il a évoqué uh, la difficulté uh, à tous les pays, y compris les pays développés, les pays en voie de développement, de pouvoir uh, répondre à ce problème. Donc, uh, uh, le problème qui est lié à la difficulté de pouvoir contrôler cette maladie immédiatement. Et il a ensuite évoqué la nécessité de pouvoir uh, résoudre ces problèmes rapidement, vu le nombre. Uh, le nombre, de, le nombre de morts causés par cette pandémie. Dans, sa, dans sa, son deuxième adresse, euh, il a survolé, euh, il a insisté le fait de pouvoir comprendre la pathologie, la maladie, la nécessité de pouvoir bien la gérer, euh, puisque maintenant c'est un problème entre les nouveaux, euh, il a situé le problème entre les nouveaux et l'ancien monde. Donc, il y a la nécessité de pouvoir assurer une sécurité globale et sanitaire. Donc, c'est un problème sanitaire, il faut des problèmes, il faut des réponses globales, euh, notamment avec les perspectives pour euh, la prise en charge globale de cette pathologie. Euh, et pour euh, cette fin, il a insisté sur les rôles que doit apporter la, la technologie dans la prise en charge de cette pathologie. Et il a fait aussi savoir les opportunités d'apprendre à travers cette session de formation. C'est une grande opportunité pour pouvoir apprendre sur les méthodes de diagnostic, les méthodes d'extraction et l'interprétation des données liées à cette pandémie. C'est aussi une occasion pour une meilleure compréhension de cette pathologie, spécialement au niveau de, sa, au niveau de son diagnostic. Il a, aussi, euh, il a aussi fait savoir qu'il euh, y a une grande nécessité 
euh, des capacités pour pouvoir répondre rapidement. Euh, enfin, il, euh, il a remercié tous les collègues de, de l'HCBS, Université de Karachi, ainsi que tous les autres participants pour euh, la collaboration active et il remercie tout le monde pour la participation. Thank you so much. Now I would like to request the resource persons on the training course to introduce themselves. So, <clears throat> hello everyone. And assalamu alaikum and good morning. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Rashid. Uh, so, um, a brief introduction. Uh, actually, I have done my PhD from Germany in molecular virology. Uh, and then I have uh, served in University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences in Pakistan and Lahore for a few months. And then I joined ICCBS in the National Institute of Virology, where I have been working for more than two years. So, here I have been uh, working with uh, uh, dengue viral research and some of the uh, waterborne uh, gastroenteritis viruses along with this COVID-19 diagnostic lab. Uh, after this uh, emergency situation, our institute has developed this emergency lab for COVID-19 diagnosis and I am a part of this COVID-19 diagnosis. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Sabah Faru, uh, and I'm working as an assistant professor at National Institute of Virology, ICCBS. I did my PhD in molecular medicine from ICCBS and my postdoctorate in virology from Germany, they diagnosed. I am involved in different types of projects such as uh, antiviral activities, epidemiological studies, and genotyping and diagnostics of um, hepatitis A, B, C, E, and SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I'm also associated with the COVID-19 laboratory at ICCBS. I will be with you on the second day of this course, and I hope and wish that this will be a very nice learning experience for you all. Thank you. Good morning. This is uh, Irfan Khan. I have a, a PhD in molecular medicine with specialization in cell biology. Uh, I'm working as assistant professor at the Institute in Molecular Medicine. Uh, I have a training in uh, regenerative medicine from USA, the Auckland University, a postdoc, and then I have uh, another postdoc uh, from University of Bordeaux, France, uh, in uh, tissue engineering. I'm working mainly on cell biology and molecular biology of the cells. So. Currently, in this COVID situation, I'm associated with the COVID lab for the diagnosis of uh, uh, COVID-19. So uh, currently, I'm working here uh, in the COVID lab. Irfan is a very bright young man. I'm sorry I forgot to mention his name, but uh, he is an extremely important member of the family. And he has done lots of work for uh, the National Institute of Virology and for the public at large. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good morning and good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Hana Iqbal from ICCPS. I have done my PhD in molecular medicine from PCMP ICCPS. I have also worked as a postdoc in, at BGI and BIG China and also at Mam Tubiduk in Turkey. My current uh, research uh, focus is towards metagenomics and epidemiological studies of SARS-CoV-2. And also, I'm uh, also inclined towards animal disease models. Uh, I'm currently associated with COVID-19 Diagnostic Laboratory at ICCBS. I will be uh, facilitating you to understand the uh, uh, real-time PCR uh, for the diagnosis of COVID-19 and its technicalities, along with Dr. Irfan on day three. I hope to have a, a really nice and wonderful uh, experience with you. Thank you. With this, 
uh, now the three days extensive training course uh, is formally started and we hope that this course will be a nice learning experience for you. Je vous remercie tous pour les trois jours de cours intensif qui vient formellement de commencer. Nous souhaitons, nous espérons que cette expérience sera une grande expérience pour l'apprentissage et pour vous. So now this is the end of inauguration and the formal training course is, is going to start. So, hello everyone again. Again, this is Dr. Rashid. So, I will be with you today, the first time, first part of the training session. So, today uh, we will be learning about the first step of the COVID-19 diagnosis, which is selection and collection of samples. As you all know that uh, COVID-19 is an emerging disease uh, which uh, has raised many concerns in the whole world. And not only it's new uh, in its emergence, but it's also new for the diagnosis because uh, the, uh, the third world countries have never experienced a respiratory, acute respiratory infection of this severity. So today in the first uh, part, uh, now we will try to summarize uh, the uh, selection of appropriate sample for the diagnosis. And uh, also how uh, an appropriate sample can be collected. Uh, so first of all, uh, the risk assessment for the diagnosis of COVID-19. As uh, clearly mentioned by Dr. Iqbal as well, that uh, the COVID-19 uh, disease has uh, shot the world and it has actually uh, reunited many nations uh, as it, it's a global challenge. The first time the world has realized that the health issues of this nature is not a local issue because of its atypical type of transmission and its mysterious uh, contingency, this virus is highly risky uh, uh, also for the medical and diagnostic professionals. What are the uh, risks associated uh, with the diagnosis? Here, it's in highly contagious respiratory viruses. As you know that uh, most of the viral infectious diseases when uh, they are um, uh, persistent in a region, normally uh, the, the transmission is slow and local because of its uh, route of transmission. Respiratory viruses are generally uh, very contagious because the route of transmission is normally airborne droplets. And uh, beside uh, having a respiratory infection, moreover, COVID-19 has proved its, itself as, as, a, as an edge on transmission over other respiratory viruses. As uh, I am showing you in the slide that the typical respiratory virus, which is influenza, has a transmission rate of approximately 1.2 to 1.6, which actually means that if uh, a person has a uh, seasonal influenza virus, it may infect one or two more people. But uh, COVID-19 has shown even more uh, transmissibility that one infected individual can infect two, two to three people uh, uh, by, transmit by transmitting through the airborne droplets. Uh, plus, it's an acute viral infection, acute of a severe nature. Very often, uh, it's mild to moderate, but sometimes it, it turns into many complications and become a severe disease. Uh, plus, there is no specific treatment options available. Antiviral treatments are not specific and they are reserved for 
very complicated cases. Um, moreover, uh, up till now, there are many vaccines which are in pipeline, but uh, there is uh, no uh, vaccine available for gender population. These are the risk uh, factors involving um, in handling with COVID uh, samples and dealing with uh, COVID-19 infected patients. How can one protect himself uh, from possible transmission? Uh, so this is uh, a second big challenge. But before uh, moving to this uh, slide, I would like to ask my colleague for a brief translation of this content. Uh, la, la, première section, la première session de la conférence. La première session de la conférence a porté sur, sur la présélection des, des données. Donc, euh, il s'agit dans cette partie de résumer les, comment il faut collecter les échantillons appropriés et comment collecter les échantillons de manière appropriée. Alors, euh, il y a eu des risques pour l'assessement des, euh, des diagnostics. Notamment, il a été évoqué ici euh, une grande probabilité de contamination. Il y a la, la possibilité de pouvoir euh, les différentes voies de contamination de l'infection virale donc, les différentes routes pour euh, la contamination. Euh, il a été évoqué comme problème euh, qu'il n'y avait pas de traitement spécifique à l'heure actuelle pour la prise en charge de cette pathologie. Et il n'y a, a pas aussi la disponibilité du vaccin. Yes. So, there are different kinds of masks available in the market uh, which you... I think all have seen a mask of different kinds. A very popular one is N95. So this is a part of PPEs, uh, personal protective equipments, and uh, for dealing with COVID-19 patient or COVID-19 sample, uh, and it is uh, recommended by WHO and CDC to use uh, a mask which can protect at least 95% uh, of the airborne droplets. The pore size for this mask is 0.3 micron and the hindrance or the trap percentage is at least 94% or 95%. <clears throat> so there are uh, different kind of masks which are technically uh, known as respirators and there are different kind of respirators. Uh, they are different because of different regulations. There are different standards uh, um, which uh, define their use. Um, here I am uh, summarizing a list, uh, FFP1, are, and uh, this is at least 80% uh, that it, it can actually blocks or holds 80% of the particles. Then FFP2, uh, or in short, it is also said P2 mask, which is uh, equivalent to uh, N95 and it has 94% blockade. And the most popular one, N95, which blocks 95% of the particles. And <clears throat> N99 or FFP3 is the superior mask. It actually blocks 99% of the particles. And the most uh, superior one is P3 or N100, <clears throat> which actually uh, gives you maximum protection against the droplets or the particles around 99.95 or 99.97 percent. Uh, so these are the masks which are used uh, normally for um, dealing uh, with COVID-19 suspected patient or uh, for dealing with uh, the COVID-19 samples in the BSL-3 laboratory. Uh, but there are some uh, masks which are used for other purposes for general use, like surgical mask. Surgical mask also gives you uh, protection. And when uh, we are having uh, no risk of airborne droplets, we are in an environment of uh, uh, without airborne droplets, the uh, surgical mask can uh, be used. 
For um, sample collection, uh, there are two uh, kind of PPEs uh, recommended based on oh, in what system we are collecting uh, the sample. So one of the sampling uh, collection strategy is uh, collecting sample through a physical barrier or uh, sample collection in a kiosk or in a, in a container. Here I'm showing you a picture. This is uh, our container. And in the later uh, phase, I will also uh, show you a video demonstration. Um, in this setting where you have a con containment area or a physical container uh, to protect yourself uh, from direct contact with the patient, you need minimal PPEs. Uh, so uh, the minimal PPEs include uh, an inner gown, a normal surgical mask and gloves and uh, uh, head covers, etc. But uh, in normal cases, uh, in, in clinical setting, when you are dealing with uh, the COVID-19 patients for, for sample collection or for the treatment, uh, where you have direct contact with the patient, uh, it requires full set of PPEs, including a good mask, at least N95 mask, and tie with suit, along with the proper uh, face shield and proper protection of gloves and head covers. Um, the world has seen uh, many different kinds of problems during this uh, pandemic and there are quite many learnings. One of the learning is a rational use of PPE. And since uh, this is first time uh, that, that the world has uh, uh, faced an atypical kind of sample Generally, our labs are, uh, are not equipped with uh, handling uh, with this kind of highly infectious sample. And the form of sample is also atypical. Uh, and and there were, therefore, um, the equipment, the personal protection equipments uh, uh, were not available initially. And the, the high demand of these equipments has created uh, a situation where the prices of all these PPEs goes much higher and it was very really difficult for the poor economies to manage this uh, kind of PPEs. And it actually um, brings everyone uh, to, uh, to figure out how PPEs can be carefully uh, used. And so there are quite many uh, strategies uh, which can minimize the use of PPEs. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the mask N95 can be rightly used where it is required, for example, in, an, in the BSL3 area where uh, the droplets um, can be produced or handling with uh, the, the samples uh, for sample sorting and uh, sample processing. Similarly, in a clinical setting where uh, we are uh, having contact with the COVID-19 patients, and in the rest of the areas where there is no physical contact with COVID-19 patient or there is no risk of airborne droplets, a normal surgical mask can protect. Uh, moreover, N95 masks uh, were considered disposable and once they are used, uh, uh, they cannot be reused initially. But later on, we learned that N95 mask uh, can be carefully used and more than uh, one time uh, it is possible to reuse. Uh, how, uh, how can we make uh, the system to, uh, to accommodate all of these limitations? It actually, uh, there are different things so which uh, determines the reuse of N95 mask, for example, uh, the how the mask is used on your face. Uh, it should be comfortably fit, not over tight. And then the filtration performance uh, it can be checked by by breathing air and out. And then uh, we we should check uh, for any dent or damage and soiling on the mask. 
and the upper surface of the mask can also be decontaminated uh, using different uh, decontamination reagents. Uh, then there are different um, the strategies, for example, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. Uh, we can put in the UV light for some time uh, or different uh, moist heat procedures can be adopted for the decontamination of your PPEs. Uh, types of specimen. So our laboratories, um, general diagnostic laboratories uh, deal with blood samples very often. Some of the atypical samples include the stool and urine samples, but this type of nasal swabs, uh, especially in the third world countries, were never a popular type of sample. And uh, this was initially uh, a problem to uh, fulfill all the supplies uh, of all the material which is required for this kind of sampling. The, the appropriate sample for COVID-19 uh, patient is respiratory secretions. As, as, as I said, that the, the virus resides in the respiratory tract. Uh, normally, it uh, infects the upper respiratory tract and the first phase where the virus replicate and uh, initially colonize, and then it goes uh, further down to the lungs. So the ideal sampling uh, for COVID-19 is the upper respiratory secretions, which include uh, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swabs. In some of the cases uh, where a patient is uh, very complicated or it has problems with the breathing or it is on the ventilator, uh, the lower respiratory specimens like sputum or endotracheal spirits can also be checked for uh, COVID-19 presence. Sample collection. So there are uh, some uh, steps uh, for sample collection. Uh, the first step is this patient information. Uh, there is a WHO defined criteria how we can screen for suspected uh, COVID-19 patients. As we all know that the symptoms of COVID-19 is uh, very similar to the normal uh, flu or normal respiratory infections like pneumonia, bacterial infections or other viral infections. And, and only uh, symptoms uh, cannot determine the real cause of uh, the infection. <clears throat> Here, um, the, um, the interviewer or, or, the, or the person who is dealing with the patient should have uh, a questionnaire who ask uh, and write down some of the patient information uh, this information is also useful for later use. For example, the symptomology uh, and, and possibility of any physical contact with uh, the travelers uh, in, in recent past or any physical contact with the, with the COVID-19 patient or any, um, any exposure to uh, the highly contagious area like hospitals or diagnostic labs and this type of information can give you uh, the more uh, uh, more precise uh, information about the patient and the possibility uh, for the screening. Uh, type of specimen, as I said, it's nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal, and this kind of uh, samples uh, require special training uh, uh, for the for the for the person who collect the sample. Uh, an inappropriate uh, sample collection may also uh, mislead at the later stage and uh, can also cause a false positive or false negative. Okay. Type of swabs. Uh, so in the later slides, I will also talk about the type of swabs. There are different type of swabs available uh, for the sampling. And in later, we will see that uh, what kind of swab we, sh we should use. A type of VTMs, uh, viral transport medium. And this term 
uh, is used for uh, for a solution which actually maintains the viability of a viral particle. And this VTM is required uh, also for uh, the COVID-19 uh, samples when it is taken from the patient. And then we will briefly talk about some differences and importance of uh, different options available. Okay, type of viral transport. So, as I said, viral uh, transport means a maximum viability. It has um, uh, for maintaining the viability. Uh, the popular one is not, uh, and uh, Okay, so there was some noise, so I would just filtering the noise. Uh, yeah, so uh, beside the nutrients, uh, it also needs uh, some antifungal and antibiotics uh, and some of the buffers to maintain its pH. So VTM is an ideal preparation for taking uh, the, the swabs, but um, a uh, VTM is generally required uh, for many for maintaining the viability when you need samples for a long time. For example, you can use this sample and then freeze it and minus 80 for later use. This medium will maintain the virus viability. Moreover, the purpose of VTM is also then if you need to uh, culture the virus for later use for research purpose, for example. So this uh, VTM maintains uh, a live viability of virus, and later, if you want to, uh, if you want to isolate the clinical uh, isolates uh, from this VTM, this can be done using this VTM. But if uh, this is not the requirement, if the only COVID-19 test is the only real-time PCR test is a requirement, then uh, this formulation can be minimized to the minimum nutrient level. And it can be uh, minimum, minimized to the PDS or normal saline level. So in this recent pandemic, we have also seen that PDS and normal saline were used uh, for sample collection. But uh, the limitation with the PDS and normal saline is that the PDS uh, can maintain uh, the uh, the particle for a very short time and freezing and thawing of a sample which is taken in DBS will distort the virus particle and the virus particle will not be viable anymore. Similarly, uh, saline has uh, the same limitation of the virus viability along with the salt uh, interaction with uh, PCR reactions. So not in every PCR reaction, but uh, in some of the PCR kits, this normal saline salt concentration can interact and can influence the PCR polymerases. Uh, one of the ideal preparation uh, which was introduced uh, in, in the recent pandemic is RNA preservatives. This is a set of a uh, solution along with the swabs, uh, which actually has um, a RNA preservative. So there are different type of formulations available in the market. It, it, it generally have um, a, a lysis buffer, which can uncoat the virus. So the virus particle is, as you know, it's, it's, a, it's a particle which is covered with a protein coat, along with this embedded long uh, proteins and this this lysis buffer will simply uh, will simply unlock this protein coat and will will break up the, the protein core and 
will release the RNA from inside. And this RNA then preserved in this preservator. So this is a solution who, which can actually maintain the, the RNA viability. So the RNA is preserved for, uh, for longer duration, even for months at the room temperature. So it does not require a, a cold storage and it, it, is, uh, it, it does not require extensive lysis buffers. And so this kind of uh, vials can be directly used very easily uh, for PCR detection. <clears throat> the second part of uh, the sample uh, collection kit is swab. Uh, for the COVID-19 test uh, or for any test uh, which requires a sample from nasopharyngeal region or from oropharyngeal region uh, for the detection of virus particle, uh, a swab must be uh, inert, uh, chemically inert, um, which actually means that it should not uh, chemically interact uh, with other uh, preparations. For example, for downstream process, there is a, a real-time PCR. So the material should be chemically inert, which do not influence the polymerase chain reaction or do not influence the polymerases. And generally, this kind of uh, materials are synthetic polymers. Very often, they are polypropylene, polyethylene polymers. Um, these polymers uh, are number one, synthetic, number two, have a different uh, possibilities uh, uh, of flexibility so it could be uh, it could be made harder and it could be made more flexible so the flexibility and hardness can be adjusted based on the type of swab uh, for example uh, the nasopharyngeal swab uh, uh, is thin and, uh, and and the at the edge it is a bit harder and uh, for, for the for, on the other side, it is a bit flexible because it, it needs to go inside uh, the nasopharyngeal cavity. Moreover, uh, this uh, this material, the swab material, should be non-biological material. Uh, previously, the wooden swabs were used uh, uh, for different kind of fat collection. But since wood or cotton or this kind of material are of biological origin, and uh, these uh, biological materials can definitely uh, interact with uh, the PCR reaction on the downstream process. And PCR reaction is, is a very sensitive uh, reaction, as you all know. And any biological contaminant uh, can cause uh, false positive uh, or false negative interpretations, and and that, that is that is why this uh, this swab should be very carefully prepared and selected, uh, and also uh, should be uh, this whole preparation should be highly sterilized. So only sterilized preparations, completely clean preparations, can be used. Okay, so what uh, patient information we normally record at the time of sampling? So, uh, we record in the patient location, patient name, father name, gender, age, address, national ID card number or any uh, personal identification numbers, his contact number for the, for, for the possible contact and the date of sample collection. 
So this is the personal or the, or the sample information which is required at the time of sampling. Okay, so um, the specimen, uh, as I said, uh, there are different guidelines uh, set by CDC uh, for, uh, for the collection and for the accuracy of diagnosis. The nasopharyngeal swab is considered initially an ideal swab for, uh, the, for the detection of uh, COVID-19 and oropharyngeal and the second uh, ideal swab. Um, but still, uh, the the chances or the um, or the or the detection percentage is approximately 62 percent in nasopharyngeal swab. Since uh, this COVID-19 virus in the later stage uh, goes inside, uh, goes in, in deeper to the respiratory region, and that is why uh, the 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 nasopharyngeal swab is uh, um, there is a very thin uh, time frame, appropriate time for the collection of swab, and sometimes mesopharyngeal swab, as I said, uh, is not an ideal preparation. And similarly, there are different studies for oropharyngeal swabs, which shows that the oropharyngeal swabs uh, are comparable to mesopharyngeal, uh, and there are quite many studies which uh, uh, are showing data that nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal both swabs are not um, um, as good as the as the, the lower respiratory tract efficiencies Uh, we take a small break here and then start in two minutes. I don't care if I'm going to take it. 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 Hello again. So, sorry, there was some uh, uh, problem with the screen, uh, uh, which is still a problem not solved. But anyhow, we, uh, we continue. So, uh, this is the information which we need uh, for the record of samples. And, and I have already talked to you, told you about the appropriate specimen. Okay, so 
now a sample collection at kiosk uh, so we will uh, show you uh, the video demonstration how a sample can be collected in a kiosk setting or a container setting and then i will also show you uh, a video demonstration of sample collection through uh, close contact and then we will briefly discuss about some of the precautions and some of the errors that are possible so I'm showing you uh, the video, and once this video will finish, we will uh, we will have a French translator uh, who will translate the content. This is the COVID-19 sample collection booth of the National Institute of Virology (ICCVS) for suspected patients. The booth has two windows for patient dealing. The booth is one of a kind designed to deal with COVID-19 patients with minimum risk and exposures involved. To work inside the container, minimum PPEs are required. This should include a gown, a face mask and gloves. The patient arrives at window one, where the necessary information is collected, such as name, ID, symptoms, and travel history. The patient is then requested to move to the sample collection window. The second window is equipped with holes and sleeves. The arms are extended out and the sample is taken. The nasopharyngeal swab is kept in one hand and the vial with VTM is kept in the other. It is important that the patient and the personnel are at the same height and are at comfortable positions. After the sample is collected, the swab is carefully and slowly inserted in the VTM vial, which is then tightly capped. The vial is then handed to the patient and is requested to keep the vial in the refrigerator that is kept outside the containers until it is transported to the RNA extraction lab. The gloves that were used to handle patient and sample are discarded outside, keeping the inside of the container risk-free. So this is a procedure uh, which shows how safely a sample can be taken through a container. So my colleague will uh, translate this procedure into uh, French. La vidéo est la. La vidéo a expliqué uh, comment les patients arrivent au lieu de prélèvement. D'abord, les patients arrivent. Dans les lieux de préservement au laboratoire, il y, a des, il y a des sacs de passage, il y a deux fenêtres différentes et il est recommandé euh, aux laboratoires de pouvoir porter les masques, de pouvoir porter les gants et de pouvoir porter les souliers pour, euh, pour la protection, pour la biosécurité. Alors, les patients arrivent. Donc ici, nous avons, euh, nous avons euh, les laboratoires qui attend l'arrivée du patient. Le patient arrive. Les informations du patient sont recueillies. Alors nous sommes à la première fenêtre. Maintenant, il va à la deuxième fenêtre, là où il y a les sacs de passage. Le laboratoire euh, euh, prend les récipients pour les prélèvements à travers les sacs des de passages pour éviter la contamination. Euh, 
Les laborantins prélèvent l'échantillon au niveau, au niveau du nez. Donc, il y a un passage, le sac, c'est le passage pour éviter la contamination entre celui qui prélève avec les patients pour euh, éviter euh, la contamination. Une fois l'échantillon prélevé, il est, mis dans un, il est déposé dans un récipient approprié. Euh, le patient prend son échantillon, il va le déposer dans un réfrigérateur. Une fois le prélèvement, le laborantin enlève les masques, enlève les, enlève les, les gants. Et les gants sont directement jetés euh, dans un... Okay, so uh, this was a um, demonstration of sample collection at container. And uh, I hope it has shown you some of the insights how the sample can be safely collected. Uh, now uh, I will take a five minutes break and during this break, I will sort out the questions which are being asked by the participants. And after this five minutes, uh, we will uh, have a brief discussion or answering session. Uh, so in this five minutes, I will just work on your questions. Dr. Rashid, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yes, Dr. Hafiz, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation. So my question is, so during the sample collection, so there is any time frame, so one person after giving the sample, there is any need to be put that uh, in between sample collection, any uh, uh, disinfection is needed to in the disinfection is needed to sample area and sample collection area. Uh, sir, Dr. Ashim, will give you the answer of this question. I note it down. This is Dr. Irfan. Uh, Yes, I know you very well. <laughs> yes, sir. So I noted down, Dr. Ashid is giving you answer for this question. Okay, I'm okay. The question, Dr. Ashid will give you one by one all of the answer for this okay, question. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you.
Okay, hello again. So, I have got some of the questions. Uh, of course, there are quite many participants and it's not possible to, to, to read even all the questions. I have just uh, sorted some of the important questions. There is one question uh, asking that time frame for sample collection. Yes, this is a very important question. Uh, what, is the, what is an ideal time? For, uh, for sampling. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, the, this COVID-19 virus is a, is a respiratory virus which actually gets inside through the respiratory tract normally from breathing in and can then in the, in the first phase can colonize in the upper respiratory tract. So <clears throat> after, uh, after the exposure, Normally, after three days, uh, nasopharyngeal samples contain a detectable amount of virus. And then on the later, uh, when the virus keep growing inside the, the respiratory tract, the, the concentration may uh, increase uh, uh, in, the, in the respiratory tract. Uh, however, uh, at the same time, the immune response has starts reacting. In some of the individuals who actually experience very mild to moderate disease, their immune system is competent enough to clear the virus in the early stage. In those patients uh, who has a very strong immune response, uh, in the first week, uh, there is a possibility that the virus could be cleared up, up uh, with the immune response. And then after one week, you will not find a virus particle in the respiratory tract. But if you have symptoms, that means that the disease is still going on and the virus is replicating inside the respiratory tract. And uh, then this is very unlikely that you do not detect uh, coronavirus inside your nasopharyngeal secretions. Okay, there is one more question. Uh, which media uh, is uh, often used for COVID-19 testing? So, um, before the COVID-19 uh, surfaced on, on, on the world, a normal GTM, universal transport medium, is very routinely used for collecting in the virus samples, uh, for example, influenza virus samples. VTM is a term, uh, as I said, it's, it's a term which is used for viral transport medium. This, this medium is uh, made and used in research laboratories also uh, for, the, for the clinical isolation of viruses in the clinical, from the clinical specimen. This uh, VTM is also used for virus culturing, um, plug assays, uh, a modified form is used. But for COVID-19 test, uh, uh, what is an appropriate medium uh, is UTM, universal transport medium. And what is the, the best for diagnosis? Here, here is the difference. So if you talk about only sample collection, sample collection does not actually explain that what are you going to do with this sample later on. So if you are going to use this sample for clinical isolates, or for research purposes, UTM is appropriate. Or VTM, um, any, any medium which has nutrients, antifungal, antibacterials, buffers in it that can maintain the virus viability for longer duration, that is ideal. But if this is not the requirement, if you are working only for diagnosis and diagnosis for a short period of time, for example, the collection of sample and the detection is within 48 hours, right? Then uh, the sample could be different. Uh, uh, then there are, then you have two options. One is, the, which is best one is that RNA preservative. So RNA preservative, as I said, is, uh, is actually made for this purpose. So it does not have a viable virus because it breaks up the virus core. Uh, and coat, but it has the RNA, which is used for uh, real-time polymerase chain reaction. 
so this uh, would be ideal, uh, but again, it's uh, this RNF preservatives are expensive, and if you need a cheaper alternate, the best uh, cheaper alternate would be PPS type, uh, normal uh, phosphates line. Uh, this is very uh, easily available, and this is a part of I think every lab. And one ml of PBS can be used uh, for the collecting uh, for the collection of nasal swab, and this PBS can be used uh, directly uh, to the PCR reaction. Uh, one more question has popped up that uh, that that, that uh, this uh, sleeves uh, as we really shown in the media that there are in the in the videos that. There are two sleeves hanging out in the in the container. So um, the question is that these sleeves may be contributing for cross contamination, that other patients can get contaminated through these sleeves. So you did, uh, I will ex I will just clarify that uh, we actually have a special material. This material is non-absorbent material, uh, um, and when one uh, person leaves the, 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 the container, leaves the window, these sleeves are clean from outside. Uh, there is a ethanol bottle, which you can see in the video, they are staying there. And uh, these sleeves then cleaned by using this ethanol after every uh, sample uh, collecting event. Okay, I think uh, we move. We, we move on. Uh, we, we are not having much time. So, in the later, at the end, in the, at the end of the, the presentation, we will again uh, take some questions and we will start some discussion. Okay, so now I will show you uh, the the next video. Um, the next video is uh, actually. Um, Sample collection uh, when you have um, a live and uh, clinical setting where you are interacting with the patients and you have a patient uh, with the close contact. Yes, and this actually this video will also uh, train you uh, for the uh, for the collection of nasopharyngeal swab. So this video is made actually to train you how one can collect the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, be because be before this pandemic, uh, this type of samples was not popular and even was not known. So we have very limited personnel trained for nasopharyngeal swab collection. And, and as Dr. Iqbal in the beginning has said that there are many learnings with this pandemic and the world is changing now. So, and viral pandemics are, are, are now on the full swing and we see Every and uh, one and second year, there's some uh, virus, uh, viral disease newly emerged. So this um, training actually aims to to train uh, the people for all the necessary um, uh, techniques to be learned for, for the preparation of future challenges. So now I will show you. This video contains instructions for isolating sample when in close contact with the patient. The kit contains a vial with VTM in it. This could be stored at the room temperature. There are two types of swabs that could be used for sample isolation, the oral and the nasal. For this sample isolation, we will use the nasal swab. Complete PPEs are required for this sample isolation. The patient is seated at a comfortable seat and is requested to stay calm. Stand slightly off from the patient to avoid direct contamination in case of sudden cough or sneeze. Tilt the head of the patient with non-dominant hand to avoid jerky movements. The swab is held like a pen and inserted horizontally, touching the floor of the nose. The swab is inserted 
till it reaches the nasopharyngeal cavity, which is about two inches in an adult patient. The swab is then immediately and carefully placed in the VTM vial, labeled with patient information and sent to the lab. So, uh, my colleague will translate uh, into French and then we will uh, talk about this video. Cette deuxième vidéo porte sur la collecte des données avec la, avec la possibilité d'interagir avec les patients puisque le contact est très proche. Donc les données, l'échantillon est prélevé. Nous avons déjà les, les matériels et les récipients pour la, collection des, pour la collecte des, des échantillons. Euh, donc les, les récipients sont préalablement préparés et vérifié. Alors, vous allez regarder si c'est lui, la branté qui collecte, les, qui va prélever les, 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 les échantillons. Il est en contact direct avec, avec les patients. Donc, quand vous regardez, il, il le met dans une position pour, euh, les, pour les maintenir stables, pour, euh, pour, une bonne, pour un bon prélèvement des de échantillons. Alors, il introduit le type est au niveau de la cavité nasopharyngienne. Donc, c'est un prélèvement profond et parfois même douloureux. Donc, vous allez voir comment il les maintient dans une position stable. Après avoir prélevé, il met l'échantillon dans, dans un tube plutôt approprié. Il ferme, il les ferme hermétiquement. Dans un type où il y a déjà, il y a déjà une, une solution. OK, so we will continue and later uh, at the end, I will take questions about uh, this video also. The second step is sample processing. Uh, sample processing, the first step of sample processing is sample transport. So uh, there are different uh, different procedures for sample transport. For example, if the diagnostic lab is inside the facility or inside the hospital, uh, it, it, it actually requires a very shorter transportation and then uh, the cold storage uh, during the transport may not be required. But if, uh, uh, if a diagnostic lab on a distant place so where uh, the sample collection and uh, diagnostic lab has uh, has a long distance in between. Then uh, the transportation requires uh, proper uh, coal storage. Plus, uh, the sample must be carefully packed. Uh, so, according to WHO guidelines, it's a triple uh, packaging protocol, uh, which actually means that the VTM vial should be sealed. Uh, uh, in a plastic bag, uh, this plastic bag should be uh, uh, should be a zipper bag, uh, and then in this zipper bag uh, can uh, can can be packed inside another plastic bag and all together in a big bag. So it's a it's a triple uh, packaging, which actually uh, makes sure that if there is any leakage or seepage, it will uh, not cause a, a contamination of samples or uh, any possibility of uh, getting uh, infection to the handlers. Uh, in my next video, I will also uh, show you uh, how we uh, perform these procedures, for example, the sample reception, how we receive samples, what are the protocols for receiving samples, and then <clears throat> how samples can be further processed. Uh, so and I have already talked fully about the cold chain maintenance. So uh, in many settings, the samples are transported uh, in, a, in an ice box container uh, with, with the ice cubes or the ice packs inside uh, that it can uh, maintain uh, a, a 
cooling environment inside and uh, make sure that uh, this coolant uh, uh, may not be uh, uh, out for a very long time uh, uh, because uh, as the time goes and this, this coolant may lose its efficiency. So uh, once we receive the samples, uh, samples must be stored uh, again uh, in a proper storage device. If a short time storage is required, for example, if you want to process the sample within a few hours, normal refrigeration at four degrees uh, is, 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 is okay for, for shorter duration. Uh, but uh, after the sample is used, once, the, once you have used the samples and you need uh, to store the samples for longer duration, for more than 48 hours, then it must be stored at minus 20 or minus 80 degrees. Uh, one uh, thing which is very important that uh, the sample collecting is one event uh, and then there are continuous change uh, chain of events up to the reporting and there must be a, a, a continuation connected chain of communication between this otherwise uh, the sample collection and the reporting uh, may not be correspondent uh, the samples should be uh, collected in a proper manner, should be labeled in a proper manner. These labels then can be stored in a proper database, and these uh, samples can be tracked properly for all the downstream procedures. Sample processing. So, <clears throat> this, uh, in the next video, as you will see, the sample processing actually includes uh, opening of samples. So opening of samples is a risky uh, is a risky thing, and it, it requires uh, biosafety level uh, A2 um, hood. Uh, so when you receive the samples, you put the samples inside the hood, uh, where. Um, a person completely equipped with all the PPEs can handle and can check uh, the, the sample for any possible leakage and then can, uh, can remove the samples from the bag and can open the samples. Labeling uh, of sample. So when we receive the samples, the sample package is labeled and every sample is also labeled. And this information must be stored properly. So you need to make a mechanism that every sample can be correctly tracked. And then uh, sorting in batches. So <clears throat> normally, if you have a lot of samples, you have to run samples in a batches. We in, in our lab can run up to 2,400 samples a day. Uh, and we, we receive hundreds of samples every day and we run the samples in batches. So if you have a lot of samples, you need to sort the samples into the batches where every batch is trackable and every sample within the batch is also trackable. So you have to figure out the mechanism. How can you efficiently connect all the steps? And then transfer of VSL3 facility. So once you have uh, prepared all uh, the batches uh, for RNA extraction, this uh, batch can be transported to uh, a biosafety level three laboratory for RNA extraction. Uh, after this um, uh, sample sorting and sample handling, uh, a very important procedure is decontamination of area and waste management. So during this procedure, if you are working in a, in a COVID-19 diagnostic lab where you are handling with hundreds of samples, you will produce a big amount of contagious waste. And this waste is hazardous not only for you, but also for general population. Every waste which is produced should be decontaminated through a proper procedure and then can be uh, processed through a normal waste procedure, which is incineration. So uh, the surfaces where you are working uh, clean before and after. 
So you can clean the bunches with 10% bleach or 70% ethanol uh, before and after you start and end the work. Uh, use of biohazard bags. So every waste uh, must be thrown in into the biohazard bags, which then will be autoclaved. And uh, there is a periodic autoclaving of the waste uh, every round of sorting or every round of uh, sample handling will end up with the autoclaving procedures and this autoclaved waste then will be processed on daily basis for incineration here i'm now showing you the video of uh, sample reception so it is starting from the sample reception and ending to the transfer into the bc3 bottle The samples are received at the designated sample reception area. The samples are received in complete PPEs. The samples are brought in in the cool box, which is temperature controlled. The container surface is disinfected before opening. The samples usually come with a tag and label from the source. The samples are kept at 4 degrees centigrade until processing, which takes place the same day. After samples are received, a sample receiving form is made to keep record. This usually has information of the source number of samples received and a confirmation of receiving. The gloves used to handle the samples are discarded before leaving the sample reception area. The samples are transported in cool box to the BSL-2 facility for sorting. The samples are processed in a biosafety class 2 type A2 cabinet. The samples are packed in a biohazard bag with patient information written on it. The sample is checked for leakage. The absorbent inside the bag is carefully observed. The samples are then marked with serial number. The same serial number is marked on the sample packet. This is then given to the personnel making a badge record sheet. This sheet is later used for reporting. The sample packet is then discarded in a biohazard bag for proper disposal. If a sample is observed to be leaked, such as the absorbent inside is soaked with the VTM, it is discarded in the biohazard bag without opening the seal. After the badge is made, it is kept in the pass box, which is equipped with UV light. 
the samples are collected by the technician working in BSL-3 lab on the other side of the pass box. After the work at the bench is done, it is thoroughly cleaned with 70% ethanol. The biosafety cabinet is also wiped. The biohazard bag used to discard leaked samples is tightly sealed with a tape making a gooseneck. This bag is then discarded in a secondary biohazard waste bag to avoid leakage. The secondary bag is also tightly taped, making a gooseneck. The bag is then taken to the autoclave. The autoclaved bags are then sent off for incineration. This is the end of the sample sorting procedure. So this video actually explained uh, the whole process uh, from sample reception, uh, sample transportation into the BSL2 facility where samples are sorted and then sample sorting and batch making, and then uh, transportation of samples into the BSL3 facility, and then cleaning and con decontamination of the lab. Now my colleague will translate uh, this content into French. La, la vidéo ci-après euh, explique comment les comment l'échantillon est reçu, donc la réception des champions. Euh, donc c'est le transporteur des champions euh, amène les champions dans un dans un bac. Euh, comme précaution, la, le bac est, est, est désinfecté avec une solution hydroalcoolique avec un désinfectant. Après avoir désinfecté, on suit, euh, on est la partie supérieure, donc la couverte. On jette euh, ce qu'on a utilisé pour essuyer dans un dans un récipient pour déchets contaminés. Une fois essuyé, le, le bac est ouvert, ouvert et l'échantillon euh, est pris, est collecté. Alors vous allez voir qu'il y a toutes les informations sur euh, l'emballage que contient l'échantillon. Après, l'échantillon est gardé au réfrigérateur. Euh, ici, il s'agit d'une fiche euh, qui contient les informations par rapport à l'échantillon reçu. Donc, celui qui réceptionne les échantillons enregistre les informations ici. Euh, avant de pouvoir être transporté, Donc les gants sont jetés dans un, un récipient pour déchets contaminés avant de pouvoir quitter la salle de prélèvement. Les receveurs des chantiers aussi jettent les gants qu'ils avaient utilisés. Ils portent des nouveaux gants. Le chantier est ensuite enlevé du réfrigérateur être euh, mis dans un second euh, bac, dans un second récipient. L'échantillon est transporté dans, une, euh, dans un autre local, dans un local le plus sécurisé que la salle de réception.
pour la seconde fois encore euh, les bagues et les récipients qui portent l'échantillon est désinfecté. Et on aussi ensuite euh, euh, sa couverte. L'échantillon est pris. Il est mis dans une sorte de hôte pour, pour la biosécurité, pour la sécurité. Alors, les, inform les informations contenues sur les informations de l'échantillon sont prélevées. De même que l'échantillon lui-même, on vérifie. On met un nouveau, un, un nouveau numéro de série sur l'échantillon, mais aussi les mêmes, les mêmes séries, les mêmes numéros de série est mis sur les sachets qui contiennent et qui contenaient l'échantillon. L'emballage ayant contenu l'échantillon, les informations de l'emballage ayant contenu l'échantillon sont enregistrées dans une fiche. Donc toutes les informations sont enregistrées sur une fiche. Vous allez voir les différents numéros. Vous avez les numéros de badge et tout ça. Donc, toutes les informations sont relatives. Une fois enregistré le numéro, le badge est jeté et l'échantillon est transporté dans un. dans une boîte avec les rayonnements UV, ultraviolet. Alors, une fois encore, la table est essuyée avec, avec un désinfectant. L'échantillon est encore euh, transporté dans un dispositif, mais on prend la proportion de pouvoir désinfecter les dispositifs qui recueillent l'échantillon. Donc, elle est avec, avec un désinfectant. Donc, le sachet jaune veut dire que l'échantillon a donc c'est Donc, tout ce qui est emballé en jaune sera jeté dans un, dans un récipient pour euh, les déchets contaminés qui est en jaune. C'est une boîte jaune. Les déchets sont prélevés dans les, dans un, dans les récipients pour déchets contaminés. Ils sont émertiquement fermés. Et puis, ils sont amenés dans un, dans un autoclave. Donc, ils sont autoclavés. Et par la suite, ils seront incinérés. Donc, il faut fermer hermétiquement l'autoclave. Donc, voilà. OK. So. <clears throat> now, uh, up till now, we have seen uh, what uh, kind of samples are required or recommended for the detection of COVID-19 tests, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the requirements for the COVID-19 testing and uh, how the sample will be collected in different settings, how the samples will be processed uh, inside the lab, uh, how the lab should be uh, in components and in composition. So this is my next topic. So I will uh, briefly tell you about an ideal COVID-19 testing lab, what, what units it requires. Uh, and I will also show you a video demonstration of our uh, BSL-2 and BSL-3 laboratories, which we are using for COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, an ideal uh, recommendation or, or you, you can say a standard recommendation for uh, COVID-19 diagnosis is a BSL-3 laboratory RNA extraction. 
However, when uh, the pandemic was on peak, uh, the WHO has relaxed uh, the policies and a BSL2 plus laboratories uh, would also be recommended or we would also be allowed for using the RNA extractions. However, in an ideal situation, a, a BSL3 biosafety level 3 laboratory is required for uh, RNA extraction. And a BSL2 biosafety level 2 unit for sample sorting, which you have already seen in our uh, previous video. A PCR pipetting unit. So, um, real time PCR is a highly sensitive technique. And if the sensor, if you are using a highly sensitive technique, uh, it is very important to keep uh, the containment areas completely separated. And therefore, it is recommended that we should pipe it uh, in, a, in, a, in a unit which is completely separate. Uh, so PCR pipetting uh, unit actually involves the pipetting of uh, master mix, uh, pipetting of uh, PCR enzymes, and any other uh, diluent if, if required. And this um, uh, pipetting is made inside this PCR pipetting unit. And then the PCR vessels will be transported to the next lab, a separate unit for RNA pipetting. The next lab or the next step is RNA addition into the sample vessel. And ideally, an RNA uh, addition lab should be completely separated, uh, where you will add uh, the expected RNA into the sample vessel. And then you should have a PCR machine area. So <clears throat> this is uh, a simple lab uh, where you have your PCR cyclers, where you will run your uh, real-time PCRs. And then you have uh, uh, a separate room where you deal with all hard and soft data for processing, for example, uh, your batch making data, your sample records, <coughs> and your reporting data will be handled in a separate, a separate area, which is confined for all data handling. <clears throat> now I will show you a video demonstration of, uh, of our lab. Welcome again. So I'm standing at the entrance of our VSL2 and VSL3 facility. So just after the entrance, there are some accessory labs. On my right hand side, there are three accessory labs which are used for DNA extraction, PCR identification, and PCR cycling. And on my left hand side, these are the labs which are used for PCR marketing, RNA extraction, and serological. So, uh, since the voice is not uh, really clear uh, inside the lab, uh, uh, because uh, in our lab we have a switch system, which is a complete separate system for air in and out, and there is some, some uh, noise inside the lab, I will again uh, briefly tell you what I have said. So, normally, Mm, a BSL-3 lab or a BSL-3 uh, entrance and sub-lab entrances have a different kind of door, which is a bit heavier than the normal doors. Why it is required? Because uh, you have uh, a pressure regulations in every lab. For example, in a BSL-3 laboratory, you have a negative pressure. And uh, for, for maintaining these pressures, you have heavy uh, doors. Uh, then just after the entrance, I have showed you two wings on my both hands. And in every wing, there are some accessory lamps. Uh, on the right hand wing, uh, I pointed out uh, the area where we have uh, PCR cyclers uh, and uh, the room where we deal with all soft and hard data reporting room. On the other hand, uh, on the left hand side, I have shown you or pointed out to you three accessory labs. 
Uh, one is used for uh, storage. Uh, the PCR kits and all other stuffs are stored in that lab. Uh, then we have a PCR pipetting area. PCR pipetting area, as I have already told you, this is used for uh, PCR preparations. And then we have an RNA lab where RNA is added into the sample vessel. Now we see uh, what else. Now I am standing at the junction of Wilson Free Laboratories. So we have two Wilson Free Laboratories. On the left hand side, there is one Wilson Free Laboratory which is connected with the Wilson booster lab. And similarly, on my right hand side, there is another Wilson Free Laboratory which is connected to some lab. So, in this clip, I have shown you two units of BSL-3 on my both hand sides, right and left. And every BSL-3 unit has a connected sub-lab, which is of biosafety level two, and which is used for sample processing, like sample sorting, batch making, as you have seen in the earlier video. In the Biosafety level two lab, uh, I have pointed out to you the safety cabinet of uh, BSC-A2. I have pointed out uh, the autoclave machine. It's a two-door autoclave. Uh, so this is an outer part of this autoclave machine. And we see later on. Here we have an autoclave unit. This autoclave is two-door autoclave, which is connected for the Basin 3 laboratory. Every waste which is produced inside Basin 3 or in Basin 2 can be autoclaved before waste. This is a pass box. Here, samples are transported inside and outside through the pass box the uh, In this uh, part, I have uh, explained you about autoclave and uh, pass box. This pass box is used for things getting inside the basin tree or things getting outside the basin tree. Uh, this trans uh, transport box is equipped with the UV lamp uh, for surface disinfectant. And it has two doors, um, and uh, they are lockable, and one door is open from one side at once.
So this is showing a sample reception area. So since I am in a minimal PP set, I avoided entrance into the sample reception area. And I'm just pointing out the area where samples are received. And you see that these two corridors are completely separated. Now I'll show you some other necessary labs in the basement training board. This is our teacher faculty lab. This area is used for PCR reaction preparations, master mix, and enzymes are biotech in this lab. And then the samples process to the RNA mixing lab. So this is the first lab uh, for the downstream process uh, for PCR. And this is used for PCR preparations, which means uh, uh, making a PCR vial, uh, diluting the PCR regions, and pipetting PCR reactions. So, and the um, and the cabinet I have shown you in this video is a PCR cabinet, uh, which is used for performing PCR reactions. is transported to the RNA mixing lab and then RNA is piped inside the one. This is RNA lab. Uh, the expected RNA uh, is piped inside the reaction vessel inside the biosafety uh, A2 hood, which is shown. So this is our PCR cycler room. Here we have real-time PCR cyclers where we run the PCRs. In this part, I have uh, shown you a PCR cycler room. So real-time PCR machines are kept here. And this is actually the room where we are sitting at the moment. Uh, so in, in my background, when the camera will be live, you will see uh, the machines in my background. Finally, this is our reporting room. Here, uh, the reports are made and then communicated to the patient. So this is our final lab. Uh, as I said, for hard and soft data handling and report preparations. Uh, my friends, uh, colleague will translate in brief this video.
brièvement, nous avons cette ouais. vidéo nous représente, donc c'est une vidéo démonstrative sur les labos qui est disponible ici à, à l'Institut national pour la virologie. Donc il, il s'agit ici d'un labo de biosécurité de niveau D. Et les labos ont différents, différents compartiments, donc différentes salles. Donc, ce qu'il faut retenir de manière générale, il y a trois grandes salles avec d'autres annexes. Donc, ce qui va nous intéresser, ce sont les, 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 les trois grandes salles. Donc, on est en train de nous montrer s'il y a les différentes, les différentes salles pour, pour les différents matériels et équipements. Alors, ici, nous sommes. Nous entrons dans la première salle. Donc, c'est une salle où il y, a, il y a certains dispositifs pour, pour, pour le travail et l'équipement. Vous allez voir BCLD, BCL3 plutôt. Donc, il s'agit ici, il s'agit d'une salle pour, pour le stockage. Vous avez une table de travail. Et puis, vous avez un dispositif de biosécurité pour les prélèvements. Alors, dans cette même salle, vous avez, vous avez l'autoclave. Donc, l'autoclave est pour pouvoir recevoir certains pour la stérilisation. Donc, qui est utilisé selon les manuels et qui, qui, est, qui est disponible. Et après l'autoclave, nous avons un sas de passage. Donc, comme nous avons expliqué là dans différentes vidéos, les passes de sage de, de, sages, de passage pour, pour, pour collecter les données, pour collecter les échantillons. Ça, c'est la première salle. Donc, à retenir, il y a l'autoclave, il, il y a les dispositifs pour, pour comme ça, c'est des, des passages. Nous avons une seconde salle. Ça, c'est la deuxième euh, principale salle. Donc, il y a quelques explications sur les dispositifs et les différentes salles sont en train d'être données. Alors, maintenant, ici, nous, sommes, nous entrons dans la deuxième salle ou bien le deuxième grand laboratoire. Donc, c'est un salle pour la préparation du PC, des PCR. Donc, la préparation de la PCR, c'est ici qu'on fait, on fait des préparations pour, pour la, la, la PCR. Et dans cette salle, vous avez, on va vous montrer plus tard. Nous sommes dans un autre labo. Donc, vous avez la plaque pour, pour les réactions. Donc, ça, c'est la plaque pour la réaction, pour, en fait, pour les différentes réactions. Ce qu'on appelle la plaque de la, de la PCL. Pour réaliser différentes réactions. Nous entrons dans un autre labo. À proprement dit, c'est dans ce labo qu y a les, que vous allez retrouver les, les, les PCL. Vous avez des pictures? 
ये वीडियो तो नहीं है तो पिक्चर है Okay. So, uh, at the end, uh, we'll talk about uh, this infection of the work area. So, uh, since this uh, this procedure involves uh, extensive transportation uh, and handling of uh, material which may be contaminated with uh, coronavirus particles. And uh, this is very important to uh, regularly uh, clean the every surface uh, and all the labs. So there are different kind of uh, uh, disinfectants available in the market. Uh, so you, you can uh, check the disinfectants in the EPA website also uh, for, for the guidance that EPA approved products uh, are better in the performance. Um, mm -hmm. There are few cleanings which housekeeping, housekeeping staff can perform for you. But there are uh, most of the cleanings which uh, um, which you have to perform by yourself if you are working in a, a COVID-19 diagnostic lab. Uh, for example, uh, cleaning uh, biosafety hoods, cleaning working bench tops uh, must be clean before and after every uh, uh, start and end of the work. The, the surface areas where you are uh, working, for example, dealing with hard and soft data, the surface areas must be cleaned. Um, this also include the surface of keyboards, mouse, and all, all the other stuff which you touch regularly. Uh, housekeeping staff can maintain cleaning uh, the floors. Uh, and the, uh, the surfaces where you touch very frequently, for example, handles of the doors must be cleaned uh, regularly. Um, so uh, for the floor cleaning, uh, disinfectant must be used. Uh, this disinfectant uh, should be safe uh, and also efficient uh, for inactivation of virus particles. So this is all about uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 diagnosis day one. Uh, in my video demonstration, I have shown you up to the biosafety level two areas. I haven't shown you biosafety level three. So tomorrow in the next session, Dr. Saba will explain you the RNA extraction procedures, which is performed inside the biosafety level three area. And we, then you will see how biosafety level three area looks like and how you work inside biosafety level three. Mm -hmm. At the end, uh, I want to, to take five minutes that I can uh, actually see your uh, questions and then we will be open for discussion. And there is one announcement for everyone. Please uh, listen carefully. There is an announcement. Kindly mention your correct names in the comments section for the certificate of attendance. Kindly mention your correct names in the comment section for the certificates. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. There is a five minutes break and then I will be back.
with uh, all the i am sorting the questions now i will take your question after 5 minutes okay 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 अरे भाई मेरे चुप हो जा चाय पिएगा चाय खाना खा ले चाय पी ले अच्छा क्या जरा टीवी देख रहा कुछ जेओ हेलो हेलो यस सर यस सर डॉक्टर साहब डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू फॉर योर नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन आई हैव वन क्वेश्चन 
so it is mandatory to have a bsl 3 laboratory to start this covid testing it is not necessary i mean it is not compulsory as i said uh, the who or cdc has relaxed his criteria only because of this emergency situation as you know that in this in this pandemic many um, third world countries and even the developing world has limited uh, number of bsl 3 laboratories and yes yes this extensive uh, load of samples requires more laboratories in every area and that is why cdc has relaxed its criteria although the corona uh, virus is a bsl 3 organism this is highly contagious uh, virus but for the diagnosis of corona bsl 2 plus lab is okay for diagnosis not for virus culture or virus isolation only for diagnosis thank you sir welcome okay so there are quite many questions i will try to answer some of them so uh, there is a question in normal saline a suitable media for a normal testing this is a question uh, no normal saline is media for normal as i have said earlier normal saline is used in a limited resource setting the supply of vtm is not good if you are running short of vtm if vtm is very expensive and you cannot afford uh, the appropriate uh, media then uh, normal saline or PPS can be used as an alternate. Okay, there is one more question. Is there any contamination on the refrigerator because many patients touch it? So this is about our uh, our video, which I have shown in the container, the, the container video, where patient has handed over his sample and he put this sample inside the refrigerator. So a participant is asking that because of this, uh, that refrigerator can be contaminated and the other patients can also be contaminated. The thing which is missing in this video is a waiting area which is where the patients sit and wait for their turn. And this sitting area has hand sanitizers. So every patient which moves to the window are basically hand sanitized before and then they go to uh, the, the area where they give the samples. And similarly, when they leave, they also clean their hands by sanitizer. So this is uh, clear. And uh, the question, does patient is in risk if he is putting, uh, this is I have already answered. Can you please highlight the facts and rumors regarding COVID-19 just to eliminate confusions? Well, uh, I don't know what kind of rumors we are talking about, uh, but COVID-19 exists as you have already seen. I think every one of us now has experienced some of uh, uh, the people in their contacts and their close contacts who has experienced COVID-19. So COVID-19 exists. Uh, okay. Now, if patient's height is not uh, equal, what what can I do? Okay. So, uh, uh, what my colleague uh, Kiran has mentioned is not about the. Uh, the, actually the, the height of a, of a person, rather the height at the time of sampling. So, because you know, you are drawing a sample from nasal, nasopharyngeal swab. So you are entering the swab inside nostrils. You should be in a position where you can look at the nose clearly and you can insert in the right position. If the sample is very, if the patient is very short, and he may use a stool. So we have two, two stools outside our container where, where that can be used for people. And we also have a chair, a, a, a long chair, uh, where the patient who is very, uh, who cannot stand, who is very sick, he can also sit. But you have to somehow adjust the height in a comfortable position that you can access the nostrils comfortably. Okay. Uh, the question, in, in a resource limited setting is not uh, an advisable to use thiazole instead of VTM for sample collection. Um, 
Yes, uh, triazole is normally used as a reagent or as a, as a, as a, as a mean of, um, of nucleic acid extraction. Yes, if you are directly starting with, with this, triazole could be an option um, for, uh, for, uh, for the extraction. But again, uh, triazole is not a media which can maintain the viability of a virus particle. Mm. Then, is there any chance of VTL contamination with another microorganisms? Well, yes. Uh, so this is not actually contamination. This actually exists, uh, not as a contaminant. So when we are drawing up a sample, e either it is an oropharyngeal swab or it's a nasopharyngeal swab, you are actually collecting everything which is inside the swab. That could be a, a a bacteria, this could be a virus, or you know, rhinovirus, influenza virus, this could be any anything else, or whatever it is. I mean, in, in the nasal swab, uh, you are having it in the in the sample. The PCR reaction, which is for COVID 19, is highly specific for COVID 19. So, you are not relying on swab, but you are actually relying on your PCR amplification kit which you have used and these kits are highly specific. You target only COVID-19 viral targets which are amplified and then detected. So for example, if you have co-infections, for example, if you have influenza or if you have ketoacidosis, whatever you have, you will not see anything except COVID-19. If there is COVID-19, you will see an amplification. If there is not, you will not see anything. <coughs> okay. Uh, if we use PBS, how long okay, we can remain viable? As I said, 48 hours. Uh, 48 hours, you can actually uh, keep uh, the samples uh, in PBS or the normal lines. And uh, the decaying process is really fast in, uh, in, in PBS and normal line. And, and that is why uh, after 48 hours, uh, the efficiency will go down. Uh, why the patient? Uh, okay, this is I've already answered. At the end, uh, kindly share PPT. Okay, we have used PBS. How longer the virus will remain viable? I have already said, said 48 hours. Uh, is there cell lines available for doing in vitro study? Okay, this is off. Actually, I'm not talking about the virus culturing and virus isolation. So you have lung epithelial lines, for example, there you can cultivate this virus and you can check the infectability of virus in different cell lines and then that cell lines you can use. But again, virus culturing is out of the scope and this lab, this diagnostic lab is not designed for virus culturing. Okay. Is there cell line? Okay. What is the broad beef media ex effect on the virus quality? Well, these are the nutrients uh, which actually uh, provide um, appropriate viscosity, appropriate medium uh, for virus to be viable because when you freeze the, the, the vial, if, the, if the, uh, the protein content is low in the medium, this virus particle will clump and break. So the viability will go down. This freezing thawing will break uh, the virus core proteins. Okay, um, why 70% ethanol just because it's surface cleaning as it's why anything to virus? Well, 70% ethanol is one of the very common thing which we use in our labs for, as a disinfectant and that is why uh, I have also, also shown you 70% ethanol. Otherwise, there are quite many disinfectants. You can check on EPA website. Some of them which we use in our lab is 10%. You know, you can use um, very strong bleach is not good. So you can adjust the bleach, 5 to 10% bleach uh, for, for surface disinfectants. Uh, plus you can use uh, hydrogen peroxides uh, uh, as, a, as a disinfectant. Uh, sodium hydroxide is a very potent um, virus inactivator. One person to two percent hydrogen uh, sodium hydroxide can also be used uh, uh, for inactivating the viruses. Normally, influenza viruses 
or, or other respiratory viruses which has enveloped and uh, popping out proteins can be inactivated by, uh, by hypox hypoxide treatment, which is sodium hydroxide treatment. So when we, um, when we work with uh, viruses, we actually discard viruses in a, in a container which has sodium hydroxide, so it immediately inactivates the virus. <clears throat> uh what should we do if the sample is leaked okay what should we do if the sample is leaked so in my video i have shown you that if you have a leaked sample uh you will not open the sample uh and but since you have the information available on the packet you can note, note down the information and you can request resampling so we normally do this that we report the sample uh, the leak sample and we request the resampling. <clears throat> okay, uh, explain difference between upper and lower respiratory specimen, please. Well, uh, upper respiratory tract specimens, as I said, in, in the oropharyngeal swabs which you collect from and the thought, uh, so you actually. Uh, insert the swab inside the mouth and you touch the upper palate in your throat and you take the swab from there. And nasopharyngeal swab you have seen in our videos from where and how you would collect. Okay, the lower respiratory specimens, as I said, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy and it's not a routine procedure. For example, if a, if a, sample, if a patient is very complicated, he is having severe difficulty in breathing and he is on ventilator, then this is sputum and this tracheal uh, aspirates can be taken. And they, these samples can be taken by medical professionals only. Okay, so medical professionals can take these samples and can be tested for, uh, for COVID-19. <clears throat> With context to oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal, uh, where we have more chances of false positive and false negative results. I mean, which method will give more accurate results? Am I clear? If not, then explain you the question. Well, it's a big debate and you will see different studies. Um, in last few months, uh, a lot of studies have evaluated different specimens for their PCR efficiencies. And one of the study which is very um, often discussed, I have already shared, um, I mean, I have already talked to you, uh, talk, talk to you about that. This is 62%. The efficiency of nasopharyngeal swab, the detection efficiency of nasopharyngeal swab is approximately 62%, which is higher uh, compared to oropharyngeal swab. But there are more studies which are comparing and this they found it compatible. But as for recommendations of CDC and WHO, nasopharyngeal swab is an ideal candidate for COVID testing. And you ask me why? Well, <clears throat> the studies have shown their efficiencies and that is why now I, I since there are different controversial, I mean, different contradicting results, uh, this is very hard to comment on it, but uh, we are detecting the viral genome, right? The viral is, virus is colonized in the respiratory tract. If we are taking sample from oropharyngeal region, this, this is a region from inside, which is, uh, which is thought from inside, and we take actually the, the salivary uh, swab uh, from, from deeper down the, the throat. Well, this region is <clears throat> not the first choice for two reasons. Number one is that you, you drink water, you eat food, and this region gets flushing uh, very often. And that is why the concentration of virus may be reduced there. While the nasopharyngeal uh, region is a, is a region where you do not have this kind of patient flushing. Uh, and that is why nasopharyngeal swab is, is uh, even more appropriate. Uh, for this uh, sample. Okay, the question uh, between, I have already answered, this is also again oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal swabs. Okay, what is the suitable cancer cell line can be used for hospital? Well, A509 cells, 
uh, its lung carcinoma cells are proper candidate for uh, for this. But again, this this question is is not for diagnosis. So the viral sculpturing is completely different thing. Um, what will the minimum distance in mouth which should be kept to gain oropharyngeal specimen? Well, there is no hard line distance explained, but you should be comfortable and you should be, uh, the patient should be accessible, right? The sample should be accessible. So um, normally um, one, 0.51 feet distance is enough uh, between you and the patient to collect the, um, the swab. What is the suitable cancer cell? This is again, I have already answered. Okay. Uh, can the COVID-19 test tell the difference between someone with an active infection and someone who was infected in past? Yes. So, PCR, real-time PCR test is actually a diagnosis of active infection. And uh, if the sample, if the virus is, uh, now see, you have got infection and when you get infection, your immune system will automatically activate and you, your immune system will start fighting against the coronavirus. When you have disease, you have symptoms, your, your infection is active, the virus is growing, at the same time, your immunity is fighting. When you have a specimen, your virus is still present in the secretions and you detected the virus in, in the secretions. That actually detects that the, the virus is not completely cleared, right? The virus is still existing in, in, the, in, in, the, in the respiratory tract. But, uh, your immunity has cleared the virus. For example, after a few weeks, you have taken nasopharyngeal swab again. Since your immunity has cleared the virus, the virus does not exist now. And your nasopharyngeal swab ideally should not have any particles. So uh, you will not find, and, and that is why uh, the recommended test uh, for, um, you know, for the for the confirmation that you are over, your uh, your infection is finished, is is recommended as uh, real time PCR. Uh, real time PCR determines that uh, the, the negative real time PCR uh, determines that now you are uh, safe and you can uh, end your isolation. Well, uh, the antibody test, uh, which is the second option. Uh, why it is not suitable? Because, as I said, that when you got infected, your immune system will start fighting. The first antibody which will be made is IgM. IgM will be available, and when you will test for antibody, uh, you you will find IgM. Presence of IgM indicate there is an infection, right? And IgG comes up later in the adoptive immune response, but presence of IgG does not actually indicate that infection is over because IgG has to come after the adaptive immune response, but the fighting is still on. If the virus is completely cleared by the IgG, the PCR should be negative. Presence of IgG inside the, the secretions determines that the fighting is going on, that IgG is working to clear up the virus. <clears throat> However, it actually confirmed that your adoptive immune response is now active and you are, I mean, later, for, for later, if your, if your infection is over and you find an optimum titer of IgG, it actually tells you that your immune system is equipped with the protection. <clears throat> What are the suitable again? Okay. <clears throat> Please answer what this question can be answered during the PCR session. Okay, this is what amplification region nowadays have been targeted for COVID-19 diagnosis through real-time PCR. Kindly tell about those primary specifications on which basis a patient with seasonal influenza or COVID-19 infected is differentiated through this PCR. 
Okay, so you know, uh, this is a question my colleague Dr. Irfan will be dealing in detail. Very brief answer is that the PCR targets highly specific target of coronavirus. There are different genes, but Dr. Irfan will tell you in detail in that on the third day. Okay, uh, there are more questions coming up. I'm actually uh, sorting up uh, the, the questions. Meanwhile, we take a short break. Hello participants. Hello participants. Uh, I will take more questions. I am working on your questions. I am sorting out. I am working on the questions. Meanwhile, I want to show you uh, the videos of donning and doffing. So um, please concentrate on the videos. These are very important. Donning and doffing are the procedures for uh, wearing and getting off of the PPEs. This video contains PPE donning instructions for sample handling. Apply one pump of hand sanitizer, rub hands palm to palm, rub the right palm over the left and vice versa. Continue to rub both hands together until the hand sanitizer is dry. The next step is donning the isolation gown. Double check the gown for defects. Don the gown by inserting the arms into the sleeves with the opening to back. Tie the neck and waist ties in bows that are easy to release as this will facilitate easy removal by eliminating the need to struggle with untying knots. Step three is donning the N95 respirator. Place the N95 respirator on your face, covering your nose and mouth. Gently mold the wire on the nose to ensure proper fit. Perform negative and positive seal checks. A surgical face mask is used to cover the respirator to avoid direct contamination and ensuring extended use. A secondary coverall is worn, which is double checked for defects. The coverall is worn by inserting the legs first.
the arms are inserted into the sleeves and the front opening is zipped. The last part requires donning of the face shield or goggles. If you are wearing goggles, ensure that they are not interfering with the fit of the N95 respirator. At no time should eye protection be readjusted in the patient care area if face respirator. The face shield is removed. Once your face shield has been removed, it is disinfected with 70% ethanol. The surface must remain wet for the appropriate wet time. Place clean face shield with the strap facing down in the next step, the cover all is removed. The zip is opened and the head cover is pushed back. Doff the gown, folding the outside of the gown tightly inwards into a ball to contain the contaminated site. In the next step, the isolation gown is removed in the similar manner. Tear open the neck and the back tie and roll the gown inwards. Gloves are removed utilizing glove in glove technique. Take the dominant hand and pinch the palm of the non dominant hand to remove the glove. The head cover is removed. The masks are removed by not touching the front part. The masks are carefully disposed of in the discarding bag. The waste produced in the doffing area is autoclaved and sent for incineration for safe disposal. The last pair of gloves is removed and hands are sanitized. Okay. okay. So, uh, the time is short. <laughs> Uh, now, so there is a question asking that what kind of nutrients we can use for making VTM. So Eagles growth medium, NEM, which is a very popular medium for uh, culturing cell lines, uh, can be used. Uh, there is um, liquid MEM available. Uh, but for preparing a cost-effective uh, viral transport medium, you need uh, MEM in powdered form. So that uh, you can use also a beef extract in powdered form. Beef extract in a powdered form you can use. But uh, this is only nutrients. Uh, you also need amphotericin B. Uh, uh, contamination and also uh, an appropriate buffer system for maintaining the pH. Uh, how to understand the result is false negative. Okay, uh, on the third day, uh, Dr. Irfan will very uh, nicely explain you in detail uh, what is false positive, what, what is false 
negatives and everything. So you will learn it. This is not simple. So I cannot answer you in two lines. Uh, okay. So there are questions. I'm wondering about the minimum requirements, facilities, number of rooms, labs to test for COVID-19 in the border. Well, Heather Hamza, uh, this is not uh, as something very, um, very straight. What you need actually, you need an isolated area for RNA expansion. You need a reasonable isolation between the PCR stops. This is what you need. So in the very small scale, if you have an area where you can fit four rooms, I think it would be fit. But the most sensitive area is the area where you are actually expecting the RNA. That must be your BSL2 plus uh, safety level. Okay. Um, now, okay, there is actually a correction or a comment uh, from Robin Abu Ghazala. Thank you very much for your correction. WHO now recommends 10 days plus three symptoms, three days for release of patients as a non infectious virus may be detected by PCR. Okay, thank you very much uh, uh, for all of you in, uh, for the participation. Um, and there is an announcement at the end uh, again, uh, because you will receive a certificate uh, for this training session. So please uh, mention your correct names in the comment section. All of you mention your correct names in the comment section so that we can prepare correct certificates for you. And once again, uh, I am really thankful to all of you. There is a huge participation, a very good number of participants. I am very happy to be with you. And I think uh, this training may help you uh, to some extent. And uh, hope to see you again tomorrow and day after. Thank you so much. Love this.